on show examining the everyday stuff of our lives and the far-reaching effects of actions have on this planet. He uses his trademark humor to help viewers gain understanding on big issues like the environment is <laughs> upbeat solutions to these critical problems. Please help me welcome to Buff State, Bill Nye the Science. Actually, it's a picture of Mars. 
My Aunt Mara is here. <laughs> I'm really distracted. I'm going to say it. Please. <laughs> so Mars is two and a half uh, astronomical units. Mercury is about 0.4, and Venus is 0.7. Now, how many people have ever been near a fire? Yes. Very good. Yes. <laughs> you may have run this test. The closer you stand to the fire, the hotter it is. Uh, <laughs> And in the solar system, you would sort of expect that, and indeed you will get that. If you stand on Mercury, on the sun side, it's well over 500 Celsius. On the cold side, it's 60 below, or 60 Kelvin. It's uh, two, almost 200, 200 and some change below zero Celsius. Then if you're on the Earth, you know about how cold it is. Now in Buffalo, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you just start laughing. How would you like to? Okay. It's cold. By human standards, it's cold. But here's the surprising thing Venus, you would think, would be somewhat warmer than the Earth, somewhat cooler than Mercury. But in general, Venus is much hotter than Mercury, substantially hotter than Mercury. It's so hot. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's going to go great. It's going to be a great time. It's so hot. Ah, it is. If you're on the surface of Mercury, you would melt lead. But metal lead would be a liquid. We don't have that here on Earth unless you build a big fire. So, uh, just to summarize, oh yeah, by the way, if you're on Mars, if you're on Mars near the equator in the summertime, it's kind of like uh, Buffalo in the spring. Right here, it's right about freezing, zero Celsius. Right here will be 10 below, 20 below, it'll be 40 below uh, if you reach above your head, a couple of meters above the ground. Because the air on Mars is so thin. <laughs> so, just to summarize, Mars is too cold, Mercury is too hot, Venus is way too hot. But the Earth is just right. And that is our fabulous dumb luck, my friends. <laughs> Back in the 1980s, during a, a sort of disco had given way to new wave, and really, I can assure you, it was not the good old days. Uh, the Russian space agent, the Soviet Union space agent, <clears throat> sent a couple spacecraft to Venus. This is a picture. The spacecraft lasted less than an hour because uh, it's 460 Celsius, and it <laughs> would melt lead. Uh, that little uh, ladle with lead, that wasn't there. That wasn't in the picture. It's, <laughs> it's Uncle Bill's embellishment. Right but it's hot on Venus, even though it's much farther from the sun than Mercury. And the reason is, the mythic, the greenhouse effect. And I'm sure you've all heard stories about the greenhouse effect. It is a true thing. Greenhouses, wait, okay. A greenhouse is seldom a greenhouse. A greenhouse is seldom a greenhouse. But even with that said, <laughs> the greenhouse effect doesn't quite work the same way a greenhouse does. A greenhouse just keeps uh, cold air from squeezing warm air up and out of it but the greenhouse effect on a planet has a much more subtle effect with gases in the atmosphere. And the big ones here on Earth, the biggest one is water vapor. And I, I want the water vapor. I'm crazy for the water vapor. Then, because uh, I drink a lot of water, and you know, I just, I want it around. And uh, then you got your uh, methane, your natural gas, it comes from bacteria. But the big thing is carbon dioxide. So here on Earth, we have a tiny amount of carbon dioxide, yet it has changed the way of the world. On Venus, they, if there are any of them, have a lot of carbon dioxide, and it makes it very hot there. Now, if you can't see this graph, I will give you some more Uncle Bill embellishment. But what you've got is the height above the Venusian surface. By the way, for those of you who are historians, I met a couple of historians at the reception, uh, we would we, we, we use the uh, word, the adjectival form. I have having the characteristics of or pertaining to Venus. 
It used to be the venereal. Uh, <laughs> and we had to coin, we had to coin a new, uh, a new uh, adjective, illusion. And so uh, if you go uh, to Venus now, we'll take these, the same graph and mess with it a little bit. Uh, if you had no greenhouse effect at all, the Earth would be somewhat below freezing. Water everywhere on Earth would be frozen. Minus 16 Celsius. Have you ever been out at minus 16 Celsius? Well, of course you have. It would be for it. It's cold. Uh, Venus would be somewhat colder without the greenhouse effect. And then Mars would be substantially colder. But with the greenhouse effect, Venus reaches 500, almost 500 Celsius uh, on the surface, and the Earth stays most places above zero. So this tiny effect, uh, this effect, rather, from this tiny amount of gas in the atmosphere has changed the world. So that all of you, along with being members of the space generation, you are members of what I like to call the climate generation. <laughs> now, to be a member of the climate generation, do you know what you have to do? You, well, you have to be born after the 23rd of June, 1988. That's when... Dr. James Hansen, or Jim Hansen, testified in front of Congress. How many, you're, you're trying to add it up. Okay. <laughs> How many people were born after June 23rd, 1980? Okay, there, deal. There, there we go. I saw a couple people in the <laughs> You should keep track of that information. It's good. But what, what I'm saying is, it was that long ago. It was 1988. Jim Hansen testified from the U.S. Congress saying, look, I've discovered the green, I mean, uh, rather, I've discovered that the greenhouse effect is especially strong and it's getting stronger because of all this carbon dioxide. And you've probably seen a couple of these famous pictures. This is the Uppsala Glacier in Argentina. It's an ice sheet. An ice sheet is a uh, word that describes a sheet of ice. <laughs> <laughs> And so there's a sheet of ice, and that was in 1928. If you go back to the same vantage point now, uh, there's no ice on the sheet. It is, it is um, a sand dune puddle place thing. <laughs> and this is because the world is getting and This picture is famous, this pair of pictures is famous, but there are hundreds or thousands of such pictures nowadays because the world is ever so slightly getting warmer. Now, ever so slight is fine for the Earth. The Earth, I, I see no evidence to suggest the Earth really cares much about what we do, but I care about what we do. I, you know, you hear the expression, we have to save the Earth. Well, the Earth's gonna be fine. What I wanna do, I wanna save the Earth for me. <laughs> me, so that I can live here. If you guys want to come along, yeah, that's great. <laughs> if you look at the Earth from space, you have to look pretty closely to even see the atmosphere. You don't even notice it unless you get up close and look at it from the edge. And the atmosphere, by any standards, really is quite thin. It's thin, and the breathable part is not even 20 kilometers. I mean, it's nothing. You can, oh yes, you can drive your uh, rocket plane or your fighter plane on a big arc up pretty high, but you, you go up there to breathe, like you go climbing some crazy thing, Mount Everest or something, you can't breathe very well. You gotta live down near the surface. Yet if you look at this picture, if you look at the Earth in a picture similar to the first one we had, the um, Hayabusa spacecraft, you don't even see it. As my old professor Carl Sagan used to say, it's like a layer of varnish on a globe. And yet, without it, you couldn't hear the sound of my voice. For one thing, oh, we'd, oh, we'd all be dead. <laughs> A couple of factors, yeah. We'd all be dead. That is funny. That's great, though. <laughs> all right. There are probably a few of you out here who are skeptical of climate change. And even if you're not, you'll probably meet people who are skeptical of climate change. And if you do meet these people, tell them to do what I did. 
I went to the Ice Core Lab in Glendale, Colorado. Not Glendale, California. That is like a whole other thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a <laughs> valley. <laughs> Glendale, Colorado is a suburb of Denver, and they have these pieces of ice cut into cylinders just about this big around and 10 meters long, 20 meters long, 15 meters long. And they drill it with a hollow drill bit. They cut out pieces of ice in Antarctica, Siberia, Greenland, all those exciting places where it is really cold. Then they keep it in this big refrigerated building. And I went there, it's 36 below Celsius, sometimes 37 below Celsius, and I said to Dr. Hinckley, the guy who runs the place, why did you pick 37 Celsius, 36 Celsius? Is that to keep the eutectic point of certain isotopes of water from uh, interacting with it? No, Bill, we didn't pick it. We took the thermostat and turned it all the way down. <laughs> it's as cold as it would go. Dude, you didn't pick it. Try that loud. Anyway, you go in there, it is, with all due respect to everyone, it is tweaking. <laughs> I know you live in Buffalo, but it is cold. You've got to put all these mittens, this thing, you've got to have a timer, you're not, it's like radioactivity, you're not allowed to be in there for more than a few minutes, your face is stinging. Anyway, you come out of there with your piece of ice, and you take it to the warm room. <laughs> <laughs> it's only 27 below. It's just, what is that, like minus 15, 7, 60, minus 20 Fahrenheit, something like this. Cold. But it feels great. Wow, this is nice here in the warm room. So you cut the thing in half like this. You cut this piece of ice in half with this perfect, beautiful little ice saw. And then you can count the layers of ice. And the layer of ice comes every year when it snows. It snows in Greenland, snow packs down, doesn't melt the way it does here or most of the places here. <laughs> I've been here in June and thought, wow, there's a patch of, wow, I'm doing <laughs> well, I went to school in Ithaca, I'm down, I'm here. <laughs> so the tines of the snowflakes, the little tentacles of the snowflakes break, and that mechanical energy releases a little heat, and then they melt, and they just turn perfectly clear, like, almost like glass. And you look closely, each layer is about this far apart, it's like 10 centimeters apart. And you can see every layer, and you can see the particles of dust. This particular one is from Greenland, and uh, the particles of dust are from China. They're from the Gobi, the desert in China. They blew all the way around the world. And then, I don't know, hey, can we dim the lights just a little? Is that madness? <laughs> but anyway, I hope you can see. <laughs> bubbles, these tiny bubbles. Tiny bubbles <laughs> in the eyes, tiny bubbles. I met Don Ho, for the, those of you in the climate generation who may not know Don Ho. <laughs> he was a Hawaiian guy. Oh, the show's back. The show's, uh, Five O is back. Yeah. She's, it's Five O. Anyway, uh, I'm kidding, there's no cops here, as far as I know. Uh, um, so you guys do whatever you normally do. <laughs> uh, Don Ho starts singing the song, Tiny, Tiny Bubbles. He's a Hawaiian performer. He's very popular for a long time. And uh, he said, you know, I've sung that song every night for 30 years. And then he said, I hate that song. <laughs> it's very funny. Anyway, so the tiny bubbles in the ice, that's where we were. They're trapped between the tines of snowflakes. They're trapped there. So if you take out your mass spectrometer, everybody, everybody have a mass spectrometer? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Then you run your analysis to see how heavy the atoms are and molecules are that are in your sample. I guess they're all volatiles, all the atoms in your sample. And then you see how far they fall. You can determine the number of neutrons <coughs> especially on the oxygen atom 